For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. My lesson today is actually going to come from 2 Corinthians. So I want you to go, you're there, I'm going there. 2 Corinthians, 3rd chapter, notice the top of your paper, 7 through, 7, uh, 7 through 18, is a passage, is the passage of which I'm going to bring my lesson. And the supremacy of grace over the law. I mean, the, today we're talking about the superiority of grace over law. And boy, Paul pounded this like crazy. All the writers of the New Covenant did because they understood the importance of it. Uh, and so in verse 7 of the third chapter, but if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stone came with glory, talking about the Mosaic law, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was, I don't mean his face, but he means glory. And the reason, there, the reason that there is glory over the face of Moses is because Moses understands the law is about Jesus Christ. The glory is about Christ. You, you dealt, he said today, come short of the glory of God. Let me tell you, the glory of God is Jesus Christ. And the glory of the glory that Moses had when he was getting the law was that the law was about Christ. The law was intended to point you to Christ. I'm going to, and, and he's making a point of this. Because of the glory of his face fading as it was, the glory, it, it, the glory of the law which was about Christ from the moment it was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, it began to fade until the coming of Christ. You're going to see that in this passage. Now he asks a question. See, that began with a, with a, a first-class condition, if. Notice in verse 7, it began with if. In verse 8, that's a protasis, the, the, the if-then. Now we're in the then. Verse 8 is the then, and it's a question. How shall the ministry of the Holy Spirit fail to, to be even more with glory? In other words, the Mosaic, Mosaic law, because it represented Christ, there was glory connected. When Moses was given it to, the glory of Christ was there because of the law. But the law was in a fading condition because it was about Christ's coming to fulfill the law. When Jesus came, he said, I came to abolish it, I came to fulfill it. All right? Now, what he's done, he says, the glory, is, the, here's the deal. When Christ would come, he would die on a cross, be buried, raised from the dead, ascend back to the Father, and the Holy Spirit would come. Now we're in an unending glory. In other words, when Christ came, the glory that the Mosaic law had, it went away and the glory was placed onto Christ where it always was anyhow. Now the focus is not on shadow Christology, it's on historical Christology. The law had the glory of Christ until he would come, and the glory would rest on him. Well, he left, and now the glories rest on the Holy Spirit of him, who testifies of Christ. You with me, what he's just said? Okay. Then in verse 9, he comes back to an if clause. This is a first-class conditional if. If the ministry of condemnation... Look at the Mosaic Law. The ministry of the Mosaic Law in verse 7 was what? Death. Spiritual death. Now he says that the ministry of the law was spiritual condemnation. Who would want to put themselves under the law? We've been freed from the law. Why would you do that? If you do it, it's bondage. They see, that's, that's Galatians 5.1. For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more, pay attention to the word much more, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. Here is the law condemns, here is Christ, righteousness. 
For if that which fades away, the Mosaic law, was with glory, because it represented Christ, much more that which remains is in glory, that is Christ and the Holy Spirit, that, that testifies of him in John 14. Having therefore such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. What's he talking about? He's talking about the new covenant and grace over the old covenant and law. And are, and are not as Moses, who used to put a veil over his face, that the sons of Israel might not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds, and this is it, but their minds were hardened, watch this now, for until this very day, while we're talking about historical Christology, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed or uplifted or removed only by Christ. Why would you ever go back to the law? But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. Why? Hardness, rejection of Christ. They accepted the law and rejected Christ. They kept the law and threw him away. But whenever a man turns to the Lord, that's the word where you get conversion, whenever the, a man turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Why? Because the law was to point you to Christ. He is the glory of the law. There is no glory in the law without Christ. Why would you go to the law? Now the Lord is the Spirit. See, He's already told us that. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom. But we all with unfailed face with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. The glory of the law was Christ. When He came, that's done. It was always fading. Now it's gone. The glory is upon Christ. He's gone. The glory of Christ is in the Holy Spirit who reflects the glory of Christ in our life. That's the new covenant. Why would you ever go back to the law? Why would you ever, ever, ever do that? You see, what Paul is saying, once again, in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, what he is saying is the superiority of grace over law. The new covenant is about grace. The old covenant is about law. Why would you ever surrender grace? Why would you ever give that up for the law when the law was never intended to do anything but to remind you, remind mankind that he was spiritually dead, spiritually conveyed, he was under transgressions. There's no way out except for Christ. He is the glory of the law. So, let's have a short word of prayer and then we're going to come and take a look at this thing why this is so important. I give you a moment of silence. Recheck your life to see whether or not there's mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins. If there is any evidence of it, then you can't study the Bible in carnality. You can only study it in spirituality. Therefore, confession of sin, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, this is about spirituality. This is about sanctification, not salvation. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse. This allows you to be restored to the filling ministry and the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, John 14. Father, we're so thankful today for your grace. We pray that we might be able to see the glory of the Lord. We are under the new covenant. It's all about the glory of the Lord. It's all about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, bringing out that, the, the testimony of Christ within us, out of us, and that glory should be reflected through our life. We have the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit reflects the glory of Christ from our life. That's why we are a light unto the world. It doesn't come from the flesh. It comes from the Spirit through conversion through Christ. And I pray, Father, we would find that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, 
when you study this 2 Corinthians of 3, 7 through 18, there are a few things that are important for you to notice that show that where I got the idea of superiority of grace over law. I got the idea from three key phrases or ideas that are in this passage. For example, the word much more. Notice that in verse 7, this word is used and, and connected with verse 8. Um, the ministry of death and letters engraved on stone came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of, the, of his face fading as it was. How shall the ministry of the Spirit fail even uh, to, to be even more, even more with glory? That's the idea. Then he comes back in verse 9 with it. Notice in verse 9, if the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more the ministry of righteousness abounds in glory. Then look at verse 11. For if that which fades away, see, each time he's talking about the law versus the old covenant law versus new covenant grace through Christ. Verse 11, for if that which fades away was with glory, it was, because the glory was reflected for reflection of Christ, law points you to Christ much more that which remains is in, is in glory. So he, he's used a phrase, much more, or exceedingly, much more, much more. All right? Then there's a word in verse 10 that says it another way. It says the same idea. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory on account, in other words, law versus grace, has no glory on account of the, uh, of the glory that surpasses it. See the word? Uh, superbalo. That surpasses it or exceeds it, uh, far above it. And so that's a, a second word. Then the word that is used as a theme throughout this whole passage is fade away. Something that's fading away. And it, this uh, combination word in the Greek language, kata argeo, is a word that means to render inoperative. To render inoperative. And, and, and we see that, that's a consistent in verse 7, 11, and 13. Okay? And, and, and this is being given up for what is coming, which is Christ, which is, remains forever. Eternal. The new covenant is eternal. The new covenant is all about the first, second coming and the rest. The old covenant was written to fade out. Agreed? And when would it fade out? What was it about? It was about Christ. When it would fade out? When he Christ came. Now that we have Christ, we're in the permanent. We're not in anything temporal. The law was temporal until Christ. Do you believe Christ came? Do you believe he's going to come again? Well, let me tell you, the law is out. The law has faded away and is kaput. I didn't make this up. I read it. <clears throat> you see that? All right. <clears throat> Maybe it's not. Now, what I did, I thought was really interesting. When I look at this text, I saw that there were three first-class conditions now, this is important that you know this. A first-class condition means that this is true. If it's true in the if part, it's true in the then part. That's a first-class condition. You know, it's an if and a then, right? There's an apo there, there's a prodigy and an apodicy. There's an if and a then. And if it's true in the if, then it's to be assumed to be true in the other, in the then part. <clears throat> now, what was interesting to me is the way they were laid out. Now, it's about, the, it's, a, it's about the Old Covenant, but it's telling us three major things about it. I saw them as benchmarkers or, or division points of the thoughts. I, for example, I, saw, I found the first one in verse 7 and 8, which was talking about the Old Covenant ministry of death. The Old Covenant's ministry was spiritual death. Jesus Christ came to correct it. To do, it, to, to, to do away with it. 
You see, the, the law was about death. The, the, the coming of Christ was about life. See the difference? The old covenant's about death. New covenant's about life. So verse 7 and 8, that's what it's about. If the ministry of death and letters engraved on stone, that's the Mosaic law. The engraved on stone is the Mosaic law. It's, it's the Big Ten right there. And there, there was more to it than that, but he's talking about, he, he, just, he just nailed the Big Ten. We know they went up there and, okay. <clears throat> uh, uh, and he deals with that there, and then verse 8, see, verse 7, it has the, the protestants, if, and verse 8 is the then. Then how shall the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? And so he has done that. Then the second time, he, he uses this if. He does this again in verse uh, 9 and 10. He does, he does it in verse 9 and 10. The old ministry, and he puts the Old Testament ministry. Look in verse 9. If the ministry, the ministry of the old covenant, if the ministry of the old covenant of condemnation, that's spiritual condemnation. It was to show you and condemn you. It was to condemn you and show you had a need for Christ. Points you to Christ. That's Galatians 3, 24, 25. <clears throat> for indeed what had glory, in this case, has no glory and account of the glory, that surpasses it. See? And then the third time he uses it in verse 11 through 18, the third time he does it, uh, in verse 11, for if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains in glory. And then he goes on through the rest of it. So you can see that what I saw him do, I saw him use the first class condition as markers to separate that. Where he talks about the ministry of the old covenant. This is what it does for you. Here's what the law does for you. Why would you go to something that... that Oh, that puts you under death, that puts you under condemnation, that's fading away, that, that, that offers you no hope apart from Christ. Why would you do that? <clears throat> well, so let me talk about three things before we get out of here. <clears throat> the ministry of the old covenant revealed all mankind under spiritual death. And how was that possible? Adam's original sin. You know, when, the, when Genesis 2.17 was given to Adam, right? Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat, what? Dying, you will die. That, that's dying. Actually, in the Hebrew, it says that. It says dying, you will die. And we know that he, they ate of the fruit, and they, they didn't die physically, but they did die spiritually. And later, because of that, they're going to die physically. Now you understand that, the plurality of death. <clears throat> okay, that takes up Genesis on your paper. That takes up the Genesis 2 and the Genesis 3 references. And it brings us to where we are in our passage, uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 7, and 8. For if, the prodigy, the if, and is true, but if the ministry of death, and it, and it, it was a ministry of death, then he puts the apotesis with a question. That's really unique. He asks a question. In verse 8, how shall the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? I mean, how do you even get the Holy Spirit? You have to go to the cross. You've got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. When you believe it, because you live in the new covenant, not the old covenant, the Holy Spirit does eight works of the Holy Spirit in your life. One of them is he takes up residence inside your body, and your body becomes known as the temple of God. It's a mobile church. Right? That's what we are. So that's just, it's just interesting how he did that. And he does that at rhetorically to, to pound a point. You go like, wait, I was, we were talking about the Mosaic Law. Now all of a sudden I'm talking about how, how the Lord and the Holy Spirit. How's that work? I just explained how it works. We're under the new covenant. When you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he died for your, your sins and mine, was buried and raised from the dead, 
when you believe it, the Holy Spirit takes up redness in your life, and He is there to glorify Christ in you. Written on the tablets of the human heart. Paul says, the Greek word, what's interesting in this passage, the Greek word for death is thanatos, which is talking about a spiritual death, which takes you back to Genesis 2.17. Thanatos. Thanatos is the opposite of Zoe. Zoe is used for eternal life. It's a spiritual life. And thanatos is spiritual death. And Paul was absolutely, when he used death, that the old covenant was a ministry of death. He used thanatos to show you, I'm talking about Adam's sin. I'm talking about Genesis 2.17. I just find all that interesting to me. When you study the book of Romans, like in Romans 5, 12, 14, 17, 21, this is what it talks about when it talks about death. When you go in there and take a look at that. And here's what Paul says in verse 17. For if the transgression of the one, Adam, death reigned through the one, and it does, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and its gift of righteousness will reign through the one, Jesus Christ. So that's what the law was, was there to teach you. I just can't imagine anybody going back to the law. Who would go back to the law? The, the Spirit has set you free. Why would you go back? See, that's the question Paul asked in Galatians 5.1. In John 5.21, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, which he, he's saying this is a big point of doctrine, he who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, watch this, but has been passed out of death into life, thanatos into Zoe. Now what did the law do? The law puts you in thanatos, but to point you to Christ that can take you to life. And you can't get it apart from Christ. You cannot get Zoe life apart from Christ. When you believe that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, when you believe it, you are passed from death into life. And that life's eternal. You are no longer dead, will never ever be dead again. That's kaput. Jesus delivers every person who believes the grace gospel of Jesus Christ from spiritual death into spiritual life. I mean, we pound this all the time in Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. There's no power in you to save yourself. Even if you go to the law, the law is going to condemn you. There's no power to save yourself. The gospel is the power of God. It's his system. In 1 John 3.14, we know that we have passed out of death. We know because I've been taught and believed. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. How do, how, what's it, what kind of love? He's not talking about human love. He's talking about divine love. You have to have a divine nature, 2 Peter 1.4, to love this love. This is a love that is of God, not for God, in God. This is a love that's in God. This is not human love. This is not human energy. This is not human. This is divine. We're talking loving 
loving out of a spiritual life the love of God. And it operates two ways. First, through the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit, and the other, through spiritual growth maturity. That's the ultimate, to be able to do it with a relaxed mental attitude under all circumstances and let the love of God flow to somebody unconditionally. They don't have to earn it. They don't have to deserve it. And what they do with it, it's their business. Well, I'm not going to give them anymore. They trashed it. Once you give it, it's a gift. What they do with it is none of your business. It's a gift. Right? Well, it ought to be. Here's the second thing. This tells us in the if clause, it tells us that the ministry of the old covenant was to reveal man's actual condemnation. You were condemned, and the law is going to only further condemn you. You were born condemned, is one of the 13 judicial charges of Adamic sin. You are, and therefore religion goes over to the law because it's in the Bible. Religion, religion goes to the Bible. They go to the law, and they, they convince themselves that the law can rescue me. If I obey the law, I find favor with God. No, you don't. You find condemnation. You don't find favor with God apart from Christ. Favor is grace. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God through Jesus Christ. Your obedience to the law is not going to get you saved. It's going to further condemn you because you can't keep it 100%, 100%. And if you're under the law, it has to be 100%, 100%. <laughs> Jeez. I mean, you're a cook goose to start with. Why would you go to the law? What possible benefit would that be? Not only that, but if you don't keep it with the people who proclaim it to be important, they're going to persecute you. They're going to condemn you. Why? Because that's what the law does. It's judgmental. It's critical. It is intended to be. I don't know. If the ministry of cond condemnation has glory, and it does, much more does the ministry of, much more, the ministry of, of righteousness abound in glory. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. He is the glory of God. The law is not there. The law had glory only because it pointed you to Christ. There's no glory in the law. It's condemnation. The glory was the answer to it. The law was to condemn. It, the law was just another way to go out from Genesis 2.17. To point you to Christ. Look, they get, they get under condemnation in Genesis 2, 17. You know what he does? He gives them 3, 15. The seed of the woman is the answer. He gives you the law to show you that there is none. And, and listen, there is none. I'm going to keep you there because the glory is Christ. How was Abraham saved? Because he, he, saw, that he saw the glory of Christ prophetically through the promise that was given to him. Abraham saw the promise. He saw the promise of, of Genesis 12. He saw the promise how it was connected to Genesis 3.15. And Galatians, the third chapter, verse 8 says, Moses got saved by the gospel, by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about a prophetic gospel. A prophetic gospel that he was given in Genesis 12 that, that came out of his Bible of Genesis 3.15. I don't know. Therefore, I can conclude that the glory of the new covenant, grace, is superior to the glory of the old covenant, law. I can make that assumption. I've got three, three third-class conditions that give, give me the privilege to make that conclusion. 
I can make a second conclusion. I can, make, I can say that the new covenant righteousness of Christ is superior to the old covenant condemnation of the law because they're con contrasted. The law says death. New covenant says, the old covenant says death with the law. The new covenant says life. Life. Freedom. The old law says condemnation. The, the, the grace and the new covenant says righteousness. Absolute righteousness as a gift. Why would you go back to the law? Why would you go back to that bondage? Why would you do that? This is the new covenant. This is the day of grace. This is a day of absolute liberty and justice for all. Wow, I think I was just going to the Constitution there for a moment. I must be getting ready for the fourth. Listen, the old covenant was fading away. It was built to go out of, out of existence. It was built to stop. It was built to cease one day. And all it did was fade away, kind of like you and I. Right? Just fading away. Right? I know, I heard you say, you speak for yourself. It's fading away. Fading away. Listen, here's the point, and we'll close. New covenant ministry of spiritual freedom in Christ is superior to Mosaic law of transgressions and condemnation. For if that which fades away with glory, much more which remains is in glory. Therefore, having such hope, that's confidence, we use boldness in our speech of grace. Not like Moses, who had a veil over his face because of the glory of Christ, nor like the sons of Israel, who had a veil over the hardness of their hearts because they rejected Christ and kept the law. But listen, here's why it's important to us, because the veil is removed by Jesus Christ, because he's the glory of God. He is the glory of God. Listen, listen to me. Why would you ever give up the hill of Golgotha for Sinai? Why would you ever give up the Golgotha for Sinai? Why would you ever in this life ever do that? Why would you ever do that? Well, apparently I was speaking to the internet. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that we live in a new covenant day. Why would we ever go back to the old way? Why would we ever go back to the old covenant? I mean, Lord, we love electricity. We don't want the old lantern. I love to be able to go out and step in that car, Father, and start it and put the air conditioner on rather than to climb aboard a horse and ride it all the way home. Thank you, Father, for the new covenant in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. All of these are by gifts, not by works. All the boast goes to you, and we're so thankful for it. Bless our people, Father. May they, may they be bold in their speech about grace. May we be bold in it. In Jesus' name, amen.